This video is part of an audiobook series featuring Supercharged How 3D Printing Will Drive Your Supply Chain by Len Panay. For more audiobooks, please visit my YouTube channel or my website for downloads. Chapter 7 Emerging Supply Chain Models In the middle of the 19th century, manufacture was predominantly local. Things were made and bought largely within one's immediate area. If you needed something, you would venture around the corner to, to the local blacksmith, butcher, or wheelwright, and they would make what you need. As mass production emerged, so did expanded global trade, and supply chains began to shift away from local areas. Manufacture was relocated wholly or piecemeal to other places where there were advantages to be had, such as cheaper labor, proximity to raw materials, or fiscal incentives. Those supply chains became truly global in the 20th century, and, by the end of that period, it wasn't just manufacturing that was sent far away. The end of the 1990s saw an explosion in offshoring other supply chains, service-based jobs in finance, human resources, and information technology were moved away in shared services and call centers that offered companies better cost and service models. It also became common for an item to be designed in one country, have its component parts manufactured in several others, have those components shipped to and assembled in another location, and be sold in a totally different market. Those practices lengthened supply chains, making them much more complex. The early, the early 20th century has seen a change in that trend. Companies are looking to simplify their supply chains, to bring their individual elements closer together, and as a result, local manufacture is now much more popular. Industry is turning back to that time when more things were made closer to home. Several factors have catalyzed this change. On the demand side, many customers recognize that long supply chains mean long lead times. Moreover, they are also increasingly aware that those extended complex logistics networks are environmentally unsustainable, an element of growing importance in customers' decision process. For instance, consumer pressure has led supermarkets to identify the farms where their produce comes from. On the supply side, many firms now recognize that long, complex supply chains represent a high risk, with key elements exposed to significant natural and human-made disruption, from tsunamis and earthquakes to unstable governments and increased oil prices. In many of the countries where manufacturing was sent to because of cheap labor, local wages have risen and no longer offer an economic incentive. Complex, long supply chains are also difficult to manage, often lacking clear visibility. This makes it difficult to understand the state and levels of raw materials, work in progress, and finished products as they move from one part of the chain to the next, or to be able to make informed decisions to improve end-to-end -end efficiency. Ultimately, whether global or local, supply chains are driven predominantly by three things, time, cost, and order accuracy. Getting the right product to the right place at the right time is the goal of every supply chain manager and the expectation of every customer. In parallel, those customers are constantly pushing prices down. They are less willing to wait, expecting ever shorter delivery times. These factors are driving companies to evolve their supply chains, adopting the best models to meet their customers' needs while balancing their own costs and budgets to do so. For example, many of Amazon's customers want very fast deliveries, so to meet those needs, the company began working on, a, on solutions to deliver a select range of products in bigger cities within an hour of a customer placing an order. They achieved this by combining excellent predictive analytics to identify what is likely to be wanted in an area, considering many human, social, and environmental factors, using delivery vans as mobile warehouses, and, where possible, having drones make deliveries. As mentioned briefly in Chapter 6, Amazon has gone so far as to patent anticipatory shipping, 
whereby it will send products before they're ordered, knowing that there will be a demand for them and redirecting lo the logistics involved to make the delivery. The pressures that drove supply chains to become more widespread in the first place are ongoing, and it is in balancing these that 3D printing will have a significant impact on shaping them, such as by bringing production closer to home, thereby lowering costs and more closely meeting c customer needs. For example, when customers need to get a critical, customized part on the same day for an urgent warranty repair, a relatively local 3D printer can meet that need. When customers need to replace a part that hasn't been made for 25 years because it comes from generations-old equipment or its original suppliers have gone out of business, 3D printing can provide a cost-effective solution. When a supply chain must reduce inventory to release working capital, but also to maintain service levels, 3D printing provides the necessary responsiveness. Where logistics are complicated, such as on an offshore oil platform or at a remote mine, again, 3D printing is a solution. 3D printing is front and center when it comes to realizing local manufacture. Ed Morris, former director of mechanical engineering and manufacturing at Lockheed Martin, and today the director of the National Additive Manufacturing Innovation Institute, said of 3D printing, quote, it tears the global supply chain apart and reassembles it as a new local system, end quote. This has been noted at national levels. China, for example, has been investing heavily in 3D printing to reduce its reliance on the importation of parts and to keep costs low by eliminating the need for long logistics chains. In 2017 alone, the country saw 1.1 billion U.S. dollars invested in the technology. This movement is part of what has been termed the democratization of technology, where technology becomes increasingly accessible to more people and better able to deliver whatever is needed to whoever needs it, when and where they need it. It has been ongoing for 30 years in many areas of business and commerce, and now 3D printing promises to bring it to manufacturing and the wider supply chain. When the word innovation is used in conversation, the first thoughts are of some new technology, and usually that is the only form of innovation that people consider. Little thought is given to how it changes products or processes, at least not initially. The biggest impacts of new technologies don't come from the technology itself, but rather from how it changes companies' ways of working. Clayton Christensen, who helped originate the concept of disruptive technology, recognized that only rarely was it just the technology that was disruptive, that what actually made the big difference was how companies made use of it, opening up innovative operating models and supply chains, something he termed disruptive innovation. Key term, disruptive innovation. The advent of personal computers changed how supply chains collect, manage, and use data. More recent developments in sensor technology that, together with data analytics, broadband connectivity, and the internet, have enabled the concept of Industry 4.0, are inspiring even more radical changes in the dynamics and operations of those supply chains. The good news is that the disruptive nature of 3D printing is already driving some business leaders to change how they operate and arrange their organizations. This can now go beyond internal changes and involve entirely new supply chain models that are faster, more flexible, and more responsive than previously possible. This is the most significant impact of 3D printing on the supply chain. The combination of being able to release designers from past constraints, to simplify designs, to make items in lots of one just as easily as lots of many, and the increased ability to deploy manufacturing more widely gives supply chains flexibilities and responsiveness that have never been achievable before, providing for a distributed, on-demand capability. It allows the boundaries between the supplier and the customer to be blurred, with manufacturing executed ever closer to the customer, potentially on their own premises, shortening supply chains and therefore response times. The possibilities are exciting. For example, the metallurgical company Metallasis is aiming to eliminate the mining spare parts supply chain completely. 
the company, which produces metal powders for 3D printing from ores using an innovative electrochemical process, is piloting a model whereby its metal powder production facility is sited at a mine in Kazakhstan, where products are used with locally placed 3D printers to make spare parts and manu manufacturing items for use in that mine. This model is currently the preferred option being explored by NASA and other organizations that are planning for future lunar and even Martian settlements. This chapter will first look at what it means to be a disruptive technology, how 3D printing fits that definition, and why that matters to supply chains. Next, it takes a closer look at the emergent supply models that 3D printing enables, grouping them into three sets. One, in-house manufacture, or IHM. Two, customer-located manufacture, or CLM. And three, customer-managed inventory, or CMI. Each is described in terms of its characteristics and operation. These new operational frontiers will allow supply chains to meet their goals faster, more cheaply, and more accurately than has ever been possible, from improving operations to making step changes in performance. A Disruptive Technology The pace of change in technology over the last 150 years has been accelerating with each passing decade, and the list of technologies that have affected what we consume, how we use things, and how things are made is considerable. In that time frame, humans have gone from only being able to get a few feet off the ground using hot air balloons to landing robotic probes on comets. City streets went from using oil lamps for illumination to automatic light-emitting diodes. Factories went from steam to solar power. Communication has gone from horse-based to smartphones, and those devices give us access to more knowledge and data than people in the mid-19th century would have been able to accumulate in their entire lifetimes. All too often, technological advances are said to be completely transformational or disruptive. Sadly, like other terms used to describe exciting things, that term is frequently misused. The term disruptive technology was originally coined by the Harvard Business School professors Clayton Christensen and Joseph Bauer in 1995. They wanted to explain why companies failed to recognize when emerging technological developments arose that would go on to completely change their fortunes, such as Digital Equipment Corporation's failure to foresee the threat from the personal computer, or Bucyrus Erie missing how hydraulic excavators would affect the demand for the big bucket steam and diesel-powered cable shovels offered by Caterpillar and John Deere. At the heart of this, they found that those companies' customers focused on te the technologies that they were accustomed to at the expense of, disrupt of disruptive solutions. I'll repeat that. They found that those companies' as customers focused on the technologies that they were accustomed to at the expense of disruptive solutions. Hmm. When they looked at past examples of disruptive technologies, they found that when those emerged, mainstream firms didn't find them particularly useful or attractive. They didn't cater to the needs of their existing customer base and projected margins that were too small and adoption was seen as too complex and costly. Eventually, a new entrant brought the disruptive technology to a new customer set, and it became established there. That foothold on the market allowed for the development of the characteristics previously dismissed as not being good enough, enabling those firms adopting the disruptive technology to meet and then surpass the needs of mainstream customers. Digital Equipment Corporation's customers were wedded to their large mini-computers. Bucyrus Erie's customers wanted the raw power of their steam and diesel-based machines. While both companies were comfortable, the disruptors were ignored, but they steadily made gains in performance, eventually taking those established companies by surprise. Managers, wrote Christensen and Bauer, must be aware of ignoring new technologies that don't initially meet the needs of their mainstream customers. They summarized that disruptive technologies display two common aspects. First, 
they have a different set of performance characteristics that are not immediately valued by existing customers, doing better in areas that are of less interest to those, while underperforming at those that are. And secondly, the pace of improvement in the characteristics that companies most value is able to be met by the new technology sometime after it first emerges. Essentially, it is born before its time. Interestingly, the technologies themselves aren't always particularly new or advanced. They are often seen as quirky and of little interest, but over time, their superior capabilities become precisely those that are required to meet fast-moving customer needs. Consider the emergence of mobile telephones, from their early days as bulky equipment with patchy coverage to today's smartphones, or the transformation of the music and movie sectors by the advent of the internet and broadband technologies. Other examples of disruptive technologies include compact discs, which decimated the vinyl record, liquid crystal displays, or LCDs, which virtually killed off cathode ray tubes, and famously, digital cameras, which took over from film. The aspects that Christensen and Bauer identified perfectly described 3D printing. It was initially seen as quirky and was adopted by designers as a tool for prototyping where the advantages in speed and flexibility of design outweighed the shortcomings in quality of finish, cost, and range of materials. Over the last 30 years, however, it has improved considerably to the point where today it can complement, if not challenge outright, established traditional manufacturing. 3D printing is, by that definition, disruptive. The question of whether 3D printing is disruptive or not is more than a game of semantics. It is an important label. Companies that recognize disruptive technologies and respond appropriately to them have a far higher probability of succeeding in the longer term and of surpassing their competitors. An example of this can be seen in the development of transistor radios. In their early days, these had poor quality, tinny sound and were sold cheaply to teenagers. Development in electronics led to significant improvements in the fidelity of the sound without increasing the price and sales of transistor radios overtook those of the expensive, higher-quality vacuum tube radios that previously had dominated the market. Very quickly thereafter, the older radio sets dropped completely out of the market, replaced by the cheaper, smaller, and far better transistor radios. The companies, the companies that saw the potential in the new technology and embraced the opportunity like Sony, soon overtook the more established firms and dominated the radio market. Following the success of Disruptive Technologies' original concept, Christensen identified that their biggest impacts came from how they affected operational models, something he termed disruptive innovation. An example of this is Netflix, which started its life in the postal-based postal DVD rental market. It then saw the opportunity that the internet brought, particularly the development of broadband, and used that as a platform to overtake rivals, such as Blockbuster, which stayed wedded to its bricks-and-mortar model. From its founding, Netflix took less than 12 years to annihilate Blockbuster. Likewise, the biggest impact from 3D printing comes from how it is used to change operational models. I'm going to read that again. The biggest impact from 3D printing comes from how it is used to change operational models. Not production, but the operation. Hmm. Supply chains become truly supercharged, able to do things that they couldn't do previously. The biggest threat to companies that don't recognize the effect that 3D printing can have on their supply chains is that they will be overtaken by others that do losing revenues and market share, and ultimately failing. Just ask those traditional hearing aid makers that didn't adapt to the new reality of their industry. Sidebar, for those of you who missed it, the entire hearing aid industry um, was converted to 3D printing or additive manufacture in less than a year. Yeah, 100%. Okay, next section. In-house manufacture. 
3D printing enables a variety of innovative operations, and the most straightforward of them is described as in-house manufacture. Here, a company adds 3D printing to the range of production methodologies that it already uses, or replaces some or all of its existing manufacturing with 3D printers. For instance, 3D printers can be used to produce the molds for its injection molding processes. This model provides the company with the benefits and flexibility that 3D printing affords, allowing more complex items to be made, lowering the cost of production through reduced wastage, and so on. The customers of those supply chains that adopt 3D printing in this way may well see an improvement in the responsiveness to their changing requirements. Many of today's examples of supply chains use 3D printing, such as GE's Leading Edge Aviation Propulsion, or LEAP, engine fuel nozzle, or, and they are based on the IH in-house manufacturing model, using 3D printing as a substitute for, for or extension of already existing manufacture. To employ the IHM model, a supply chain first needs to identify which items may be produced using 3D printing in ways that bring benefits, such as lowering production costs, greater freedom in design, and so on. This calls for an understanding of the product and parts characteristics that are employed and made, such as their form and materials, lead times for delivery, costs, and so on. That data will also inform the choice of 3D printing technology and identify opportunities from redesigning items for 3D printing, such as simplifying or including design features otherwise not possible. Objects' designs must be digital. New designs can be so from the outset, while legacy items may need their designs converted into the right format. Once the business case demonstrates that 3D printing is the better option and the design data is available, a decision is needed on the best channel for, to obtain the services of a 3D printer, either leasing or buying one, or assigning the job to a 3D printing hub. From an implementation perspective, the IHM model is the quickest way to adopt 3D printing into the supply chain, potentially taking just a few days to implement. One common use for the IHM model is to drive down inventory levels that supply chains hold as they shift from an operational model that sees them making to stock or storing large numbers of spares and other items to producing them on demand from digital files. This is the very embodiment of a make-to-order strategy, an example of which is the Deutsche Bahn case example described earlier in Chapter 5 where they redesigned parts of the inside of a passenger train. Reducing inventory levels while moving to make to order can potentially reduce the necessary footprints of retail stores, since store-based stock is a key contributor to their size. Moreover, items made to order can, pre can be produced with the most up-to-date designs, incorporating amendments or modifications since their initial design. Customer Located Manufacture, or CLM. While the IHM model keeps manufacturing closer to the supplier, directly or indirectly with a 3D printing hub, the Customer Located Manufacture model takes advantage of the greater flexibility in where to locate manufacturing, putting it where one needs it most. Typically, this involves the supplier placing 3D printer-based manufacturing closer to, or even within, their customer's location, enabling the supplier to provide the customer with the parts more quickly. For instance, the customer identifies a requirement and sends a demand signal to the supplier, who in turn sends the digital file to the 3D printer near or at the customer's location, where the required item is then produced. In the right circumstances, that customer location can virtually be anywhere in the world. Here, the digital design file and the instruction of 3D printers remain under the control of the supplier, as does operating, maintaining, and repairing it. Issues such as post-processing and finishing are the responsibility of the supplier and need to be included in the arrangement of the solution. An earlier example involving the placement of Made in Space's 3D printer on the International Space Station is a good example of how a CLM model can work. 
the astronaut on the ISS as the customer sends a buy signal to NASA as the supplier, which then transmits the design data to the ISS installed 3D printer to make what was required. This model can radically alter the dynamics of a company, and many firms are already actively investigating it, most notably those in the automotive sector, such as Ford, Mercedes-Benz, and Daimler, with the aspiration of placing 3D printers in vehicle servicing centers to produce spare parts. When a customer needs a part that can be made on the locally cited 3D printer, the manufacturer sends the design file, and the part is fabricated locally rather than having to be shipped to the center. This is a particularly enticing proposition, particularly when logistics are difficult and distances large. In effect, like with the ISS example, delivery lead times drastically reduce, limited to the time to make an object. Amazon's recent patent to place 3D printers on trucks that can print en route to their destination or be temporarily located at the end customer's base is another example of CLM. The viability of the CLM model depends on several factors, many of which are significant hurdles to 3D printing generally. First, as with the IHM model, it requires a good understanding of what items a company supplies, the materials that go into making it, how it is designed, and so on, to identify candidate items for 3D printing. For instance, items are restricted in how many materials can comprise them, and they re must require little or no assembly. Certainly, a key factor in the business case for CLM will be those lead times that customers face. Can a CLM approach offer better times than would be otherwise the case? In most situations involving international borders, overseas logistics, and geographical restrictions, CLM may well be the preferred option. The model only works if the entire production process for a needed item can be carried out locally, which requires the necessary equipment, raw materials, and operating skills to be locally available, as well as the capability for local, post-production, and finishing. Other business functions have similar challenges, and lessons learned from those can be leveraged. For instance, many firms employ IT equipment that is located at their premises but provided and supported by third parties, such as PCs, server racks, and photocopiers. Those customers may carry out basic maintenance and repairs, such as clearing paper blockages or replacing ink cartridges on photocopiers, and the supplier carries out the more involved work. One way to mitigate this need for local supplier personnel is to push the IHM model with outsourced production further toward the CLM model and use an outsourced production facility closer to the customer to obtain the lead time benefits. Already, companies like Fast Radius and 3D Hubs have witnessed several of their clients using this outsourcing-enabled version of CLM, with lead times reduced to next day. Customer Managed Inventory, or CMI. Customer, man customer located manufacturer keeps responsibility for 3D printing manufacture with the supplier, which responds to a buy signal from their customer and sends a digital file to the 3D printer near them. Customer managed inventory moves that responsibility to the customer. The 1980s and 90s saw the emergence of vendor managed inventory, or VMI. With this replenishment model, a supplier is contracted to ensure that there is a minimum stock level of its products at the right place at all times, leaving the customer responsible for scheduling logistics, demand sensing, and so on. As opposed to the CLM model, where the control of what is produced and when it is made rests with the supplier, the CMI model places that control with the customer, using 3D printing to make items on demand, with little or no interaction with the supplier. Moreover, the customer themselves have their own 3D printers owned or leased, with many potential technologies represented, giving them a wider range of materials to work with. Digital designs are available on demand through a licensing agreement, and the customer then instructs their own 3D printers to produce the desired object, much as they would with a local, just-in-time dispensary. 
If the customer has the right 3D printers available, they can enter into CMI relationships with several suppliers, whose products all can be made on the same machines. The CMI model holds promise for several sectors, particularly those with difficult logistics, such as the armed forces. In 2013, the U.S. Army deployed its Rapid Equipping Force, or REF, to Afghanistan to function as a local fab lab, essentially a factory in a box. The REF was equipped with 3D printers, CNC milling machines, and other tools to produce spare parts locally far more quickly than resupplying by aircraft. A CMI model, which would remove the computer-aided design, or CAD, burden from the Army personnel by giving them locally available item designs, is being investigated as a potential future development. As James Zunino, a materials engineer for the U.S. Army Armament Research, Development, and Engineering Center, told a conference on the technology in the military environment, quote, If you are a soldier in an FOB, forward operating base, in Afghanistan, everything is different. It's not as easy as running down to the Home Depot and picking up a screwdriver. Those costs add up. When you add all the transportation costs, fuel, security, it then might be cheaper to be able to 3D print one. End quote. The CMI model gives the customer far greater control of what items they have and can make at any given moment, taking away the supplier's involvement in those. Delivery lead times are reduced to the time to make the items. The CMI model is the most complex of those emerging models, and while currently no companies are actively using it, many are contemplating it, held back by the wider considerations. One of these, explored in more detail in Chapter 8, is the need for suppliers to develop new pricing models to accommodate 3D printing. This is particularly important for the CMI model, where suppliers are virtually distant from manufacturer and delivery supply chain activities. There needs to be an effective licensing mechanism to ensure that the customer isn't abusing the model, such as by making 10 items while only paying for one. Similar issues were faced by the music industry when digitally recording CDs became available to consumers, opening the possibility of mass piracy and threatening royalties. The solutions that that sector developed will no doubt be considered by those using 3D printing designs. As well as license controls, configuration control of the designs is also required, with suppliers having to ensure that customers have the latest approved digital designs for their specific requirements. The use and nature of digital designs makes it easier to keep up to date, minimizing delays in production as well as procurement costs. Furthermore, as for the CLM model, issues of data security need to be considered. Toward a virtual 3D printed supply chain. Many of today's most innovative companies have utterly changed the conventional wisdom of what is needed to operate in their sectors. For example, Uber is one of the largest companies in the transportation sector, yet it owns no vehicles. Airbnb is one of the biggest companies in the hotel industry, yet it does not own any hotels. Both have done this by outsourcing those physical parts of their operations. This modus operandi is now entering manufacturing, with the beverage maker Fevertree as a pioneer. Fevertree mi produces mixers such as tonic water, ginger ale, and colas. The company has had meteoric growth, something that had been particularly difficult to achieve in the beverages sector where other firms like Coca-Cola, Schweppes, and PepsiCo dominated worldwide. And yet, the firm's growth since founding in 2005 saw it achieve revenues of 225 million US dollars by 2017, with global year-on-year -year growth above 60% and a 2017 market capitalization above 3 billion US dollars. This has been achieved by outsourcing most of its manufacture and logistics to third parties, retaining a small team of full-time employees to focus on marketing, sales, quality control, finance, legal, and sourcing. 
The latter function has been critical to the success of their products, while a strong branding message has taken Fever Tree into most of the bars and pubs in the UK before opening up to the US market. Away from the beverages sector, this model of outsourcing the physical parts of the supply chain from design through manufacturing to logistics is particularly suited to supply chains that employ 3D printing. The benefits are clear. First, fast startup and ramp up times. As manufacturing is 3D printing based, it can be established far quicker than with traditional techniques. Moreover, it can be scaled as order volumes increase, recognizing the limitations in volumes and speed. Second, agility and responsiveness to market demand changes. 3D printing-based manufacturing is able to respond to dynamic or customized needs given the greater freedoms in design that 3D printing offers and the ease with which designs can be altered. Finally, lower logistical costs with higher service levels. As manufacturing can be located closer or at customer locations and offered as a service to produce items on demand, logistical costs are greatly reduced while retaining the capability to provide what is needed relatively quickly. Moreover, this can be accomplished across national borders and overseas, significantly reducing lead times and costs from tariffs and customs. As in the case of Fever Tree, the beverage provider, what is left for the company is marketing, sales, quality control, finance, legal, finance and legal, with a supply chain focusing on sourcing and supplier management. Suppliers being the third-party designers, 3D printing hubs, and logistics companies. At the heart of such an operating model are issues of quality and intellectual property, and not all firms are comfortable outsourcing what can be core competencies to third parties. However, the advent of more widespread and high-quality 3D printing hubs, together with improved access to the skills needed to engender a Design for Additive Manufacture, or DFAM, approach in designs, means that this model will emerge in the near future. It may come from existing supply chains that pivot their ways of working, as Deutsche Bahn is doing through the Mobility Goes Additive Consortium. Alternatively, it will emerge from a totally new startup. Where, wherever it comes from, the new model will inevitably upend the dynamics of the sector which it is in. The new operating models that 3D printing allows for will no doubt change how customer demands are met, offering companies innovative ways to reduce order times and increase customer service levels. Given the reasonable ease with which 3D printing can be added to or replace existing manufacture that we saw in the previous chapters, it is tempting for companies to dive right in and start 3D printing things tomorrow. However, as with most strategic technologies, it isn't that simple. There are many wider implications that need to be taken into consideration, and many of those need to be planned for in changes made to how a business operates. These changes will be considered in the next chapter. Thank you for watching. Please like, subscribe, and visit my channel for more exciting content.